Good morning. morning. It's good to see you. I give you um, a welcome. Um, Just before uh, John comes to uh, bring the word of God to us, there he is, Um, I'll uh, commit our meeting to God. Heavenly Father, as we gather now for worship, we pray that you might join us by your Spirit. We pray that what we sing and what we pray might be acceptable to you. Lord, as we heard last week, we have not come for a good time. We have come that you might be blessed. And in so doing, we will be blessed also. Lord, we pray that as the word of God is opened, both in its reading and in its preaching, that the Holy Spirit of truth might descend and apply what we read and what we hear to the very core of our being. We commit this hour to you now in Jesus' name. Sanctify our time, we pray. Amen. 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 John. Uh, The reading is from Romans. It's uh, from chapter 11, 33 to 36, and then chapter 12. Well, that's... uh, Romans chapter 11, 33, 36, and chapter 12. <clears throat> oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out! Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Mm. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather Think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the measure of faith God has given you. Just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, 
If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Let's sing together 424 from the Mission Prayer Hymn Book. 424, Lo, He Comes with Clouds Descending. this morning we would bless you and worship you honor you and magnify your name oh we look forward to the day when the Lord Jesus will return and claim this rebel planet as his own we thank you that you have claimed us already but one day every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that our Christ is Lord Lord of Lords and King of Kings all shall bow before him and Lord, we pray that the day will hasten. We have longed for it. 
We continue to long for it. And Lord, we know you are coming quickly. And yet, Lord, you tarry and you delay that more sinners might receive salvation. That we here on the earth, before you call us home, might perform acts of service and work for you. Oh Lord, make us useful, we pray. Lord, we pray for our nation at this time. We pray for our Queen as we prayed last week. We pray for her government. We pray for its people that once again the great God of heaven would move in this land and draw men and women to themselves. Lord, we cannot argue anyone into the kingdom. We cannot persuade them. Only you can draw them, albeit through us. And so, Lord, we pray. We pray for our unconverted friends and relatives, our sons and daughters, our fathers, our mothers, our, our friends. Lord, we pray that you might convict of sin, that you might expose the shallow emptiness of a life without you and that somehow we might speak unto them the very words of truth we thank you lord for your provision we thank you that you have kept us and guided us and secured us lord we thank you for your amazing grace which has been so lavished upon us Lord few of us are wise few of us are noble or wealthy few of us are respected by the world and yet Lord we know that you the sublime one Deigns to join with us today. Amen. Amen. Gemma, would you read? I'm reading from the first book, uh, first John, and um, chapter one. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. This is the message which we have heard <coughs> from him, and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not ours only, but also the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, 
Truly, the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write to you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I write to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven, you for his name's sake. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. I write to you, little children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the wicked one. Do not love the world, or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away and the lust of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. Little children, it is the last hour, and ha- as you have heard that the, old, the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not ours. If they had been of us, they would have continued with us, but they went out that they may be made manifest, that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and there is no lie of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is the Antichrist, who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son, does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you will also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us eternal life. Amen. Thank you. 681, and we'll sing it as it is written. Crowns for the conquerors I 
and white robes to wear, there will be no more sorrow or pain. And the battles of earth shall be lost in the sight of the glorious Lamb that was slain. Now the King of the ages approaches the earth. He will burst through the gates of the sky. And no man shall bow down to his beautiful name. We shall rise with a shout, we shall fly. Come on heaven's children, the city is in sight. There will be no sadness on the other side. Now the king of the ages approaches the earth. He will burst through the gates of the sky, and all men shall bow down to his beautiful name. We shall rise with a shout, we shall fly. Amen. Reading from Mark 13. From verse 5. Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumours of wars, do not be troubled, for such things must happen, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. But watch out for yourselves. For they will deliver you up to councils, and you will be beaten in the synagogues. You will be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. <coughs> but when they arrest you and deliver you up, do not worry beforehand or premeditate what you will speak. But whatever is given you in that hour, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Now brother will betray brother to death, and a father, his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Amen. Let's sing 835. <coughs> Thank you. 
May now your church rise with power and love this glorious gospel proclaim. In every nation salvation will come to those who believe in your name. Help us bring light to the world. Come now around your word. Open our eyes, our ears, our minds, our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. (coughs) Turn, if you would, to the last book of the Bible and the last chapter of the last book. We may finish it today, we may not. Revelation chapter 22, from verse 12. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to give to everyone according to his work. I am the beginning, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life, and may enter through the gates into the city. But outside are dogs, sorcerers, and sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and Whoever loves and practices a lie. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you. These things in the churches, I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. I'll leave it there for now. So if you cast your minds back to previous Sunday mornings, we have read about the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, and the new earth. And here we have an expression in verse 12, which we read already in verse 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. And one might ask, well, we've been waiting a long time. Where is he? And Peter, I think, in his second epistle and anticipates the impatience of the ungodly where is this coming nothing has changed or altered since the time of the fathers and yet once again it is worth remembering 
that eternity is not governed by the orbit of a small planet around a small star. Our Christ is outside of time. Furthermore, the Apostle reminds us that to a timeless, ageless God, a millennium is like a day, and a day a millennium. He is coming quickly. And he wants you to know that. Behold, see, observe, pay attention, consider, think about. I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give everyone according to his work. And I've said it before, I'll say to God again, there are two different judgments in the Bible. There is the great and terrible judgment of the white throne. Books are opened. And on that basis, condemnation will be the verdict. If you are a believer, if you know that Christ Jesus died in your place upon that cross and rose again on your behalf, the great white throne offers no terror to you, for Christ bore that terror on Calvary. There is no terror or judgment left. And yet, we Christians will stand before him to give an account of what we have done in the body for him. This is not to determine whether we go to heaven. That is decided. Our salvation is purchased and it will not be unpurchased we will not find that we that the price wasn't quite paid and yet paul talks to the corinthians in the second epistle there too that we will appear before him the beamer the judgment seat of christ and some will escape as it were as though they had Escaped from a house through the flames. They have nothing left, nothing to show, but they have their life. Some of us spend our Christian lives building with straw and wood. And when the day of fire comes, there will be nothing to show for it. Others are building with gold and silver and precious stones. And for that, the Lord will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I always pity the, Chris, the Christian who is more dedicated to his career than to the gospel. Because when you're well dedicated to your career, you will be promoted and respected. And you'll have a wonderfully fatter pension. But such accolades will be destroyed in the fire of his coming. It's what we do for him that will be spoken of in eternity. Give your life to something that will last forever. And not for something that will rot away or be eaten by moths or pinched. By burglars. So when in verse 12 he speaks of bringing his reward, eternal life he does not bring because you've already got it. He who believes in the Son has life. You have eternal life now. Says John, I write these things that you might know. You have eternal life. We have it now. The body is not eternal. But the spirit within is regenerate. No, eternal life is not the reward. But there will be levels of commendation when he comes. Thus he will give to everyone 
according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first letter, the last letter of that Greek alphabet. Well, what on earth does that mean? He is the A to Z, as it were. Well, it's a lovely expression. He begins the book of Revelation in verse 8 of chapter 1. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He says that at the beginning. I am the Alpha and the Omega. He says it at the end. Is it a clever literary device? We might go a step further and consider Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God. The Bible says that through him, Christ, all things were made. There he is in the beginning of the cosmos, in the beginning of the Bible. Here he is at the end of the Bible and at the end of the age. He was there at the beginning. He will be there at the end. Or think of that time when you came to Christ. It was he who was drawing you to himself. He wasn't the pastor or the evangelist or the tract. It certainly wasn't your own state of spiritual enlightenment. It was him. He was there at the beginning. In fact, he was wooing you before you even knew him. He was knitting you together in your mother's womb. Before she even knew you were there. He is the Alpha. And he'll be there at the end. Someone said to me, I'm afraid of dying alone. In some anonymous care home. Where the staff are too busy to care. Maybe. Maybe you dread that also, but let me tell you, you will never die alone. Because he who knitted you together in the womb, he who drew you to him, will be there on that last dying hour. He'll also be there to greet you. He won't send Peter. He'll be there himself. He'll go to the gate of heaven. And welcome you. Because he is the Alpha. And the Omega. And there are many people today who care not for him. He is a, a historical footnote. An interesting person, perhaps, an influential person, but they live their lives without him. As though he were a nobody. He is the Alpha and the Omega. By him, you will rise or fall in Israel. The builders rejected him. But to we who believe, he is precious. He is the first and the last. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the first back from the dead. Where he goes, you will follow. Remember, when the devil would remind you of your sin. That you're unworthy. You're not good enough for heaven. You say, I agree. What? So what? For my Jesus has paid the price. And where he is, I will follow. Verse 14. Blessed are those who do his commandments. Some expressions will be who wash their, their garments. 
that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. Now, remember, because I've been preaching this over a period of time and we've had uh, various other people come to preach and we've had Easter, you may have forgotten the glories of New Jerusalem which precede this chapter. The translucent gold, the huge gates of pearl, the angels, the lamb. Well, he's now speaking of those who will enter in, who will go to New Jerusalem and will never be asked to leave. Well, they who enter in are those who obey. Who obey his commandments. This is no works religion. Here's a long list of rules. Keep them all and you may get there. That's what all the cults and the false religions will tell you. Complete these actions. Perform these rituals. And if you've done enough of them. You might just be good enough to get there. The Bible says the only place you're good enough to get to is hell itself. If you want to obey him, you obey the gospel. You repent and you believe. Ah, say some. But if we're not saved by what we do, we're saved by what he has done. Why now should we live good lives? After all, if sin abounds, grace will abound even more. If you are a, a true believer... If the God of heaven has truly poured his grace into your heart, you will want to obey him. Not because your place in heaven depends on it, but because you love him. Because you want to please him. Because your nature has changed and you now live for him and not for self. And they who obey him, they will have the right to the tree of life. You'll have an entitlement to partake of its fruit. Adam and Eve lost any entitlement they had to it. They were expelled from the garden. And an angel placed there to make sure they never tried to sneak back. You see, they had no right to that tree. But in Christ, you have the right because he has the right and you get there on his merit. In verse 15, we have another reminder of those who are not permitted to enter. Wouldn't it have been far nicer if we, we, we hadn't mentioned verse 15? And we're just focused on all the good stuff, the encouragement. Heaven's going to be great and you're going to get there. And yet there is a, a warning. There are some people who do not make it in. A sorcerer. Those who try to, through magic and powers not belonging to them, try to influence events outside of God's providence. They who lived without him, who wanted power without him, will not spend eternity with him. Those who uh, abuse their own bodies in ways he never intended will not be admitted. Those who destroy others will, will not be admitted. Those who worship other gods will not be admitted. Those who love lies and practice them will not be admitted. To practice a lie is one thing. But these people love it. Lies always cause harm in the end. 
But often we enjoy being lied to. And the biggest lie... Well, I'm spoiled for choice, aren't I? But <laughs> several of the biggest lies, well, we, we have them in the, the first book of the Bible. Has God truly said? And Eve appointed herself the moral guardian of Eden. She could reinterpret what God said. She would determine which fruits were suitable to the palate and which were not. You decide what's right and wrong. Here's another lie which people love to hear. You are good enough to for heaven. But we're not. And who wants to hear that? There are pious, devout people out there who've been on pilgrimage here and there and they pray faithfully and they do this and they do that and they live very worldly pleasing lives but they too have sinned none of them are righteous no not one in fact if anything their self-appointed righteousness is simply a source of personal pride it has the very opposite of effect of what they have wanted You may notice I've left out a word. Outside are dogs. And when I read that, I thought, I'm rather fond <laughs> of dogs. Why? Why are they singled out? Of course, it's not referring to our furry friends, but rather it is a, a picture of the type of people who have rejected Christ. I think in Psalm 22, the Lord Jesus describes how not only have bulls surrounded him, but the dogs also. For dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. Interesting use of the word dog there. Now, we know that by Christ and his crucifixion, that is the wonderful, albeit bloody, means by which we are reconciled to God. And our sins atoned for. But they who crucified him were not thinking, let's kill him in order to save the world. They were killing him because of their cruelty, their enmity, their bitterness, their pride. Had they known that they were crucifying the king of glory, they would not have hammered the nails with such alacrity. Nor gone to the trouble of fashioning a crown <coughs> from a thorn bush. I think the bodies of Ahab and Jezebel were said to be eaten by the dogs. Now here the, the dogs are part of the, the punishment which God ordained to that wicked couple. God often uses wickedness to chastise and punish. Think of when he raised up Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to destroy the temple and carry off his own people. Nebuchadnezzar was no godly man. He is rebuked severely in the book of Daniel. A dog is that which is unclean. Those of you at the Bible study, think of how Second Peter likens the, the false teachers to being like a brute beast, charging here, charging there, following an instinct, 
following a passion, following a lust. These people have never loved Christ, they've never lived for him, they've despised him, rejected him, and ignored him. And now they are outside the city. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. The Lord himself wants us to know what we have read. Now, I've heard pastors say, well, I never preach on Revelation. I can understand why. And let's face it, I started with the easy bits, did I not? And yet this book is something we ought to read. It's something we ought to know. It is something we ought to consider. Because Christ himself revealed it. And he says of himself, I am the the root and offspring of David, the bright and morning star. We spent two years looking at the life of David. And although David is in many respects a very imperfect man, there is in his life so much pointing to one who would come. From the, the felling of Goliath to the preparing of the temple site. We can see one coming from David who would be greater than David. Great David's greater son. He is the offspring of David. The heir of David's throne. The rightful king of Israel. And yet he is the root of David. David came from him. For it was Christ who knitted David together in his mother's womb. Though he be conceived in iniquity, he was God's own creation. And who chose David to be king? Samuel would have chosen an elder brother, but God said, I want that one. He is the Alpha and the Omega. Though he was physically descended from David when he was born as a human, yet he was the God of David, whom David served. He is the bright and morning star. This world is getting darker. The Judeo-Christian morality, which for so long we have taken for granted, is being challenged and ridiculed. The gospel is increasingly out of kilter with the world, or rather the other way around. And though the world grows dark, there is a bright morning star shining which heralds the dawn. I think it was Balaam who beheld a star rising in Jacob. Interesting here that the Lord is alluding to the, the Hebrew scriptures. David and Balaam. This is new, no newfangled thing. There is no Old Testament God and New Testament God. Oh, the Old Testament God is quite strict and harsh. But the New Testament God is quite loving and nice. The God of both Testaments is the, the, the same one. He is merciful and just and righteous and, in, and loving in both. Interestingly, in the second chapter... Of the book. Speaking I, I think to Thyatira. He says unto. He who overcomes and keeps my works until the end. To him I will give power. 
over the nations. He shall rule with them a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I have received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. He will give the overcomer the morning star, yet he describes himself at the end of the book as the morning star. When we get to New Jerusalem, will we wear special white robes? Possibly, I don't know. Will we wear crowns? Maybe. Whether you're given special raiment or a crown to wear, the most precious thing you will have Nay, the most precious thing you have now is Christ himself. I am my beloved's and he is mine. And his banner over me is love. You can lose everything. But if you have him, you have everything. And we might get to heaven. And God says, there's no crown for you. And they'll say, well, if I have Christ, I have enough. He is my all in all. He is your all in all. You see, the dogs never loved him. They like the jewels and the gold, but they, they've never loved Christ himself. And that's why he never knew them. The spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit I, I take to be the Holy Spirit here on earth inhabiting believers. And the bride being the church itself. Are longing for Christ to return. Let him who hears say, come. How many of us say, come, but not yet? <laughs> How many of us have got plans to go here and there, to do this and do that, to decorate there and to visit that? And to the unbeliever, God says, you fool. Tonight I demand your soul. To the believer, he says, my child... You're coming home tonight. And whether we are alive on the earth when he comes for us or whether he calls us home individually and meets us at the gates. That deep down is what every believer wants. So, oh, sure, we, we, we might have people we leave behind and we're concerned about them. But rest assured, he cares for them more than you do. And he can take care when you cannot. And then still in verse 17, the emphasis kind of, of, of switches. And the, the first part, the spirit and the bride and the hearer say, Lord, come. The, the second part of the verse is, is the Lord inviting others to come to him. Let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. You know, it might be that when I read verse 15, you found yourself in there. I've been immoral. You may not have murdered, but you may have murdered in your heart. If you've hated someone and wished them dead, you're as much a murderer as he who looks at a woman lustfully is an adulterer. 
And verse 15 is a terrible warning. But verse 17 is a wonderful invitation. And if you're thirsting for eternal life, if you're thirsting for that spiritual fulfilment which only Christ can give, the invitation is to you. See, here is the, the water of life. Come and drink. You're thirsty. Come and be satisfied. Isaiah says, Ho! Oh, everyone who thirsts, come. You've no money. Come buy. How can you buy without money? I remember when I was growing up, we always travelled by, by bus. We never had much money. We could afford a bus fare. But there was one particular bus driver. Whatever money we'd give him, he kind of pressed us up the machine. He came back out and we collected it and we got on for free. <laughs> and I, I, I bought the ticket. But it cost me nothing. Says Isaiah. Come by. You who have no money. If you're thirsty. Come and be satisfied. Oh no, but verse 18, there's another warning. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life. Now, I don't think God is in the business of rubbing out names. If he were, I would not sleep tonight. But he who fiddles around with God's word, chopping off a bit here, mm. adding a little bit there, they were never in it to begin with. And I fear for those and the, the, the principle here I, I think refers not just to the book of Revelation but the whole Biblia to which it belongs they who would tamper with God's word or withhold some of it or add a little bit of their own revelation to spice it up woe is them Wouldn't it be far easier if we just stuck to it? He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming quickly. He who is the truth says he is coming quickly. Again, quick by his definition, perhaps not quick by ours. <clears throat> Let's also consider that had he come as quickly as perhaps the early believers imagined, we would never have been born. We would never have believed. I wonder if God delays his return, if Christ tarries in heaven, To wait for people to be converted and saved and forgiven that he might share with them the water of life amen even so come lord jesus the grace of our lord jesus christ be with you all amen you should have a piece of a4 paper this is our closing hymn. You may not know the words. I'm almost certain you know the tune. And this is the hymn with which we'll close our meeting. Mine eyes are 
have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He has loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible sword. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching on. I have seen him in the watch fires all the hundred circling camps. They have filled it him and also in the evening trees and dams. I have read his righteous sentence by the demon wearing lamps. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, Fiery gospel written, burnish rose of steel as ye deal with my condemned soul. With you, my grace shall deal. Let the hero born of woman cross the serpent with his heel. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Sounded from the trumpet that shall never call retreat. He is sifting out the hearts of men before his judgment seat. Oh, be swift, my soul, to answer him. Be jubilant, my feet. His truth is marching on. Glory, glory, In the beauty of the lily, Christ will fall across the sea, with a glory in his bosom that transfigures you and me. As he died to make men holy, let him die to make men free, his truth is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. He is coming like the glory of the morning on the way. He is wisdom to the mighty, he is succor to the great. So the world shall be his foster one, the soul of time is great. Our God is marching on. Glory, glory, hallelujah. And now, may the God of peace sanctify you, true and true, soul, spirit and body, so that you might be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it, even so, Lord. 
Come quickly. Amen. Amen.